Steve, welcome back. Thank you so much for coming back. Um, I know it's been a uh, it's been a uh, a bit of an up and down here in the last month and a half to or so. You know, first it was live, and then it was going to be in Ohio, and now it's not. Now it's here, and I just it's fantastic that you're able to to make time. Uh, everybody clamored for more, Dave, after the last Dave. So. <laughs> You are uh, you're a hot commodity, and we are very happy to hear, uh, hear you talk about uh, the the the, the you know, making things secure. And uh, you bring a, a wonderfully unique perspective to things because you're you're also kind of geeky, which is a as I think you may have noticed a, a bit that's near and dear to my heart as well. It is too. Uh, so I understand. I am not going to actually try to introduce the man who can't be introduced. I'm going to leave it to him. Well, uh, my introduction will simply be that I hope not to disappoint. Hearing that people clamored for more is a bit intimidating since uh, this was pitched to me as that talk was great. Can you give that talk to our, our national meeting, which is what you're going to get? Uh, there's, it's always being updated. There's always a few tweaks. In fact, I was just literally at one of my distributors today uh, in their showroom, and I said, oh, there's some safes, and I took some pictures of the the safes in the showroom, which illustrate more of the points that we'll be talking about. But yes, this this is the gun storage talk, and it's about safes and so much more. Uh, let me see as I'm sharing screen here, if I also share sound and optimize a little bit here, optimize for video. All right, can you, uh, can you see what I've got going on still? Yep, looks good. Excellent, excellent. And I realize that this little Zoom annoyance is in the way. There we go. So for those who don't know, I am a professional thief. That is how I, you know, get all the cool stuff on the shelf and the payphone over there and you name it. Uh, no, what I do is so I, I break into places. Uh, my name is Devian Olaf. I am a covert entry technician. My team in this photo, uh, we are not authorized to, to be in this building officially. I mean, we're being paid to be in this building by management, but no one there has given us the correct credentials or permissions and so forth. We have broken in. We pick locks, we bypass alarms, we compromise access control systems. And in my case, I also neutralize safes. So I am a safe technician. I'm a SAVTA certified safe technician. I'm a LOA certified. I work on government bases. I service vault doors, uh, you name it. If it is a container meant to house something that you don't want someone to get inside of, I can probably work on it and tell you some things about it. We teach courses on safe manipulation. It's a whole lot of fun. Uh, in general, safes are pretty fun to open. I think if, uh, let me know if I'm talking, if this, if you can still hear me while the, the video is playing. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Good, good. So what you were watching there, uh, that's the safe on Air Force One. Uh, not the one that's currently, you know, flying around the country. That's the retired Air Force One that served Eisenhower, Kennedy, Nixon, etc. And what I was doing is I just walked by it. We were, you know, on the tour at the, the Museum of Flight. It's right near us uh, in Seattle is where Museum of Flight is. And we went through Air Force One and people are looking at all the so forth. And I went, oh, there's a safe down there. Uh, for those who don't know, here's, you just get little tidbits this whole time. Uh, the default out of service combination is 50, 25, 50, especially in government land. So if you have a safe that's kind of disused or someone doesn't know what's up with it, try 50, 25, 50. That's what I did on Air Force One and the docents were very surprised. Uh, they said that probably hadn't been opened in a couple decades. And I can report to you, it is no longer set to that. But uh, if that doesn't work, I mean, there's a lot I can do. Again, I love the sanitized language in some of our, some of our trades. So this is an example of neutralizing a government safe on an army base that held some classified materials and stopped working correctly. So I was able to take care of that. Being able to drill, uh, sometimes violently, sometimes very neatly into a safe is something that we do. So understanding what they can stand up to. This is, a, this is actually, again, you mentioned being geeky and techy, and a number of you may have heard about this. Uh, you may not have seen this footage before, but you heard about this. You remember that DNS root key signing ceremony that couldn't proceed? They were everyone got together and all of a sudden they couldn't get the safe open. It malfunctioned. Yeah, that's it. It's right there in the secure cage. Uh, they had to call someone like me in to get it open, but to neutralize the container. 
but in addition to being a lock and safe person, I am I am plenty more. I am a enjoyer of whiskey and an enjoyer of wine and an enjoyer of uh, firearms. So I have been shooting from a, a very, very early age. Uh, it was just guns were pretty normal in my household. We weren't, um, yeah, we, we weren't like a huge collection, a huge go to the range all the time family. But my, my wife and I both come from military families. Uh, my father had a few guns. I got my you know, like, just like uh, Ralphie in, in Christmas Story, right? Like, I got my air rifle when I was eight years old. I still have it in the safe, actually, my Crossman pump gun. Uh, my dad, you know, he had a Browning Challenger and some wheel guns and things. So I started going to the range with him, and I've been shooting ever since. Uh, oh, someone else says, Mark says, I have that same Crossman. Yeah, man, it's a game day player. It'll stand up to the daisy any day of the week. Uh, my wife and I are in the same boat. Uh, she, you know, I mean, she grew up on farms. I grew up in farm country. So to this day, we still go out, we hunt, um, we, you know, do some competition. I, I always like mentioning uh, Action Shooting International. If you're interested in getting into competitive shooting, it's kind of like IDPA light. Uh, it's move and shoot and, you know, practical shooting, but it's not very aggressive on the body. Uh, I have kind of a bad knee, so it's not jumping over barriers and crawling through tunnels. Uh, it's nice. It's nice, though, to put yourself on the clock. I write for a number of publications, uh, a lot about flying with firearms. You may have seen on like the firearm blog. I write for them. I write for a few other places. I can have, you know, I've had concealed carry permits in many states. I've lived many states. I run shooting events. I like them to be very catering to new shooters. I enjoy milling, 3D printing. Uh, I've made my own firearms in many ways. Here's, you know, Polymer 80 that I cranked out on the mill and turned it into one of my nice pistols. I have a build that's kind of just a fun trunk gun. My favorite build that I made from the ground up, this was a retro rifle build that was featured on my friend's YouTube channel where I wanted to sort of recreate a very early pattern of Colt AR-15, including remaking all of the roll marks and so forth that I engraved into it. So that was that's the kind of person I am. I, this is one small piece of my collection. I wouldn't really call myself a collector, the like collectors in quotes, the joke I mentioned, is that, uh, oh, someone says that was a neat series. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, the joke about collecting. I think many of us are the collectors in quotes, right? We've been buying firearms, many of us since we were 18, and we buy them often, but sell them rarely. So yeah, I let some of them go, but they grow legs a lot of time once they get in the safe. So storing our firearms, right? That's what we're talking about today, not just in safes, but in, in wider contexts something that you want to always keep in mind. And if I'm talking a little fast, again, I'm monitoring the chat. If you miss something, I'm happy to loop back. I know we've got a lot of amazing material today, so I don't want to hold anyone up. I want to make sure everything I can get through for you and you get to hear the other speakers as well. So if I'm talking too fast though, please, I want this to be accessible to everyone. Starting with, you don't just go out and say, well, I got to get a safe. Tell me all about the best safe. Well, before we do anything in sort of building our security posture, this applies to not just gun storage, but you know what I do for companies, evaluating their buildings, evaluating their processes and their policies. Threat modeling is really where you start when you think about what you're trying to protect and from whom, okay? So that's part of every client kickoff call, right? When, when we're going to do a penetration engagement against a building, there's a lot of skill we bring to bear on the situation. But if we're modeling, you know, a, an actor who's like an opportunistic street criminal, like they're worried about someone just kind of breaking in a steel laptops out of the office. Well, I'm not going to break out all of my super advanced government grade gear because that doesn't emulate the, the, the aggressor that they're worried about. Uh, many people do tell us, and this is a thing, uh, you know, sort of what you might call a street hardened criminal or a, uh, a experienced criminal, criminal with actual trade experience, those who've been in maybe an alarm installer or a cable technician. Uh, there's, I told this story, I believe, the last time I gave this talk to some of you in a smaller setting. My UPS store, where I was going to ship some packages, this was last year. I said, hey, can I uh, ship a bunch of this stuff out? They said, is, is it already labeled? I said, yeah, you know me, it's already labeled. They said, okay, good, good. We can't process anything. We can't charge any money right now. The internet's down. I said, oh man, that stinks. What's happening? Like, yeah, I know. Tell me about it. The drugstore got hit. I said, what? He said, oh yeah, yeah. There's this crew that apparently tries to rob the narcotics out of the drugstore. It's in the same strip mall. Uh, and they know exactly where the internet junction box is. They knock it out. And this has happened, you know, like once or twice the last few years. 
and it knocks out the internet for this whole block. I went, damn, that's pretty, that's pretty tight. That's, that's an amazing, I didn't, you don't expect like, you know, narcotics thieves to have that kind of skill set, but some do. And our corporate customers say sometimes, hey, well, what if someone has some knowledge? How do we make it a little better? What if there's a whole bunch of people with very low knowledge? What if your worry is civil unrest? You know, what if a corporate client says, well, we we're actually worried about corporate espionage, like highly trained individuals. Okay, I'm going to have a different conversation with those people. And what about if they're worried that their own employees might be the threat or might be helping the threat, some kind of an insider job? So these are all different ways that one of my clients might look at their situation. And then I say, okay, answer me those questions. Then we get into the next steps. And that's how we have to think about our firearms, right? For the most part, you know, every the for the children, for the children, for the children. And, you know, I get it. You know, protecting children, guns and children, how they mix or don't mix is a very common topic and refrain in this country. So you'll see, oh, I've got these guns. I got to make them child safe. All right. Well, what, what kind of children? There's different levels of kind of, of modeling we can do here, right? There's very young children. In these cases, you're sort of guarding against accidental discharge, right? Guarding against unintentional or sort of curious exploring. But these aren't kids who are really determined to like find the guns and handle the guns. That's different from older children, right? If we're, you know, have, we have, we're raising responsible kids, we're gonna leave them alone sometimes on their own, go out to dinner, go out for a movie. Uh, maybe those are kids who start to get a little more deliberate in their curious attempts at looking around the house. There's intentionality there that's very different. And even if you kind of trust your kids pretty much, maybe you want certain barriers in place that'll not just stand up to accidental discovery, but intentional exploring. Uh, maybe some of us have a problem with grown children, right? You've got a real lummox of a roommate or somebody's boyfriend is, you know, your roommate's got a boyfriend and they're kind of a loser. And this person just can't be trusted around firearms. That's very different than having other housemates who you would trust. And maybe they have the combination to the safe, but what if this guy finds out? Maybe you have a lot of strangers in your house or like friends of a friend. If you host a lot of dinner parties or just other parties, right? Um, there's just, some people have that. Let's get in the, the backyard. We'll have a barbecue. People coming and going, invited by you or invited by other people who know these people. How are you worried about those risks when people are kind of just generally around the guns? <clears throat> Do you have a readily accessible firearm for home defense, but you have to remember to move it into a different location if you're going to be hosting a party? Maybe you rent. Maybe you live somewhere where the management company has the permission to enter your property with you know 48 hours notice or something like that. And if you're away on a business trip and you can't get home, you get this email, you're like, oh, damn, I've got that, you know, gun in the display rack. And now there's going to be a maintenance person there. And I don't know what they're going to be doing. And of course, there's theft, right? That's another big one. We went from like, got to check, protect the children. And now, you know, got to guard against intentional theft. But intentional theft has different levels, right? What is the likelihood of theft you might face based on where you live, based on the size and value of your collection, so there's, you know, just untargeted smash and grab kind of crime. Somebody breaks in the door and they're looking just to swipe a few bits of jewelry and medicine. Are they going to grab your gun? Are they not? Really low level theft can be hilarious. Uh, this is this is a video that's amazing to me. This is a crew of guys. I think they opportunistically just saw a big screen TV in a lobby. So they backed up. Instantly, it's obvious they did not think this through. This guy expects to lift it off the wall like a painting. That does not go well. So he starts reefing on it, pulling on it, reefing on it, banging on it, but he's got help, right? He's got his guy who's lookout, comes around the corner, cracks into the window, falls back down, comes in through the broken glass, slips all over it, falling all over himself. This guy is like, all right, I'm helping. I'm going to open the hatchback. I don't think this TV fits in that hatchback, but they still haven't gotten it off the wall, falling again on the broken glass smashing the TV to smithereens at this point. Now they've realized it's completely destroyed. Good job, fellas. So they leave it alone. And then they slip all over the glass trying to get out of there. Yeah, this, this video, this is the caliber of some criminals, right? So if you just have anything that protects your gun against an immediate pick it up and run away with it, you might be in better shape than some folk. But there are criminals who are much more advanced and methodical and plan their assault. 
this is a robbery from a sporting goods store that included some guns. And this guy, he's wearing a mask. This was before COVID, but he's covering himself up. He's got a hat. He actually came in through kind of a ceiling uh, vent type area. He's walking around. He's grabbing ammo. He's grabbing expensive things. Let's look at a video of a more planned and professionally executed robbery. This was a gang of guys in Texas and they cased a, they cased a store, a gun store, and they knew what their hours were. They knew they'd be closed on the weekend. And well, you'll see what's gonna happen here. They hook up a truck with chains to the front grate, give it a few tugs, bash it back and forth. And then as soon as that gets ripped off, everyone has a job to do. Everyone runs in, everyone knows their role, You've got some people with hammers, smashy, smashy, smashy on the display cases. Some people had clearly done some homework and knew what they wanted, going explicitly for certain things. And then most of the people are just grab guys. They've got bags with them. You, the number of times I've seen criminal footage where they don't even have, you know, like they're stealing from retail and just running out with like stuff in their arms. But these guys have bags, they're ready to go. They're not tripping over each other. They're going up one aisle and down the other. This was advanced, this was planned, and this is something that the store just was not ready for. You know, they did not have all, like if that store maybe had run a cable lock through all of those arms in the rack, maybe that would have thwarted this, but glass cases and nothing else, just those bars on the front, in and out, just like that. Maybe you have a really high value collection Maybe you have a really professional assailant who's willing to disable alarms. Like those guys, they weren't disabling the alarm. They just burst in and out. Maybe you have someone who's actually going to try to come in on the weekend or come in when you're gone and actually knock out your alarms and get through your safe the way I would get through your safe and make off with incredibly irreplaceable things. If your collection is that advanced, something to consider. And one other type of concern is, of course, ourselves and our loved ones. And if we have any sort of depression, that people, people struggle with all kinds of uh, variations in their mental state. Some very temporary, some are ongoing. But if you have anyone in your life who may not be safe around firearms in a limited basis, this is something we need to normalize talking about. This is something, and every time I've given this talk, I've mentioned, and other people have gotten in touch with me saying, yeah, I did that before. Someone going through a really bad bake, but bad breakup. I did this. I took my guns out of my house, put them in my office where I wasn't going to be for a few days. Just wanted to find the bottom of a glass and a bottle next to it. This is what we used to call a hard reset. And, uh, you know, a couple of bottles of bourbon and a couple of tubs of ice cream. And then I was right as rain, but you know, cause that's the mature way to deal with your problems, I guess. But that's the kind of thing that be being prepared to be like, all right, I should not, there's no reason I need to be around any firearms. If any breaks in this house, they're going to get me at my worst anyway. So I don't need a gun right now added to the mix. That's a kind of a concern to keep in mind as well. So we've talked about threats to our assets. What about different kinds of assets? Literally different types of guns and gun collections. Maybe you're a person who just has kind of a small personal collection. Like that's kind of what I put collector and, you know, in quotes before. Uh, this guy's got some pistols, some rifles, some long guns. Uh, in addition to that, he seems to collect pizza boxes. Maybe you have sort of practical use firearms where some of them are defensive, some of them are hunting uh, related and sports related. Maybe some of them are stored in very different places in different contexts. You need the defensive ones sooner. The hunting ones can be out, you know, in the garage or in the pole barn or something like that. Maybe you have a concealed carry permit and you have a, a firearm that you're on your person all the time. And at the end of each day, you're putting it in the safe, taking it out of the safe, putting it in. The, and you need a much more rapid access solution that's not like trudging all the way down to the basement and opening a combination lock every single day that you wanna grab it. Your defensive guns, if they're home defense guns, what floor are they on? What location on that floor? How rapid is your access? We kind of think about this, but don't always think it through. Um, there's a great deal of collection that my wife and I have that is not on the level of our home where the bedroom is. Like the defensive guns, there's a few there, but the rest of the collection doesn't have to be there, but the defensive guns certainly do. We needed a different storage solution for safely having a few of those arms in the bedroom. What if it's not just home defense, but community defense, right? So another friend of mine, she's a YouTuber. She talks about how firearms are not just for your own personal protection, but if you face civil unrest or threats from organized hate groups and others that it, the Pacific Northwest, we've got our share of problems around here. And I know many people who get together 
uh, the John Brown Gun Club is a great example of some others who engage in community defense. So you're not just running out of your house with a rifle, like you have full kit, right? Like you've got to run a radio. You Do you have plates? Do you have all that gear somewhere that's the same place? Yes, it is. That's a, that is tactical girlfriend. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like if you don't, li- you don't follow like yellow peril tactical is another group that talks a lot about this, right? Like if you don't know how to run your kit and if you don't have it all in one spot, how much, you know, good is that doing? If you ha- like, I can grab my rifle right away. I need the rest of that stuff. Oh, well, that's, you know, that's in the attic or something. I don't know. So yeah, right on. Uh, I love, by the way, when once the first time I got my first, uh, you know, chest rig, uh, <laughs> my wife and her best friend called it a bullet Bjorn. So that is canon now, just so we're all aware. Uh, that is exactly what we have to all call those because that is wonderful. Maybe you have really expensive shooting gear, right? Another, another friend of ours, uh, she's Finnish. So this is Jenny, Jenny K from Finland. She's a sports shooter. She's traveling with expensive rifles, expensive glass, learning about how to not just store it when she's at home, but store it for transport. Again, I've talked a lot about flying with firearms and having the right kind of cases and locks on your cases to do that. Different considerations for different situations. And maybe you just have, you know, like, again, I've got friends that have really extensive and expensive collections, really rare stuff, irreplaceable items, Title II NFA items, uh, some of you recognize probably this wall. Uh, this is my friend Ian. Uh, it shows up in some of his videos, right? Yeah, so this is, this is Ian's old house. The, the new house has a wall that's even bigger. Uh, again, like Ian and his wife, they kind of remind us of like, you know, the Gummers, if you ever watch Tremors. Uh, they're great folk, they're, which also was set in, uh, in Arizona, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, there's, there's different situations that everyone faces and different things we are protecting. And where are we protecting them? Usually we talk about gun storage in the house, right? Like within our homes or maybe, you know, in an office. But what if you're outside of the house, right? What if you have a gun in your trunk, in your vehicle? What if you have a vehicle gun? What if you're on the road? Maybe you're visiting friends, right? If you unexpectedly crash at someone's house, like, do you keep your gun in your car? What if, do you keep it in the room in that house? What if there's kids in the house? Are you being a good house guest if you hadn't planned in advance for that? Considerations when you're flying, again, you can ask me in the Q&A later, like all about flying with firearms. There's a whole bunch of different tips and tricks. I have a specific sort of travel gun kit that I have that serves me well on the road. So I, uh, you can see in addition to having my pistol in my little range bag, which has some you know, laser targets for dry fire practice and it's got a bit of ammo. The ammo is in its own little locked container. If I'm passing through a very non-permissive state for some reason, and I want my gun locked separately from the ammo. It's already locked separately from the ammo. I don't have to fumble around with that. If I'm spending the night at someone's house and they've got kids and so forth, I can throw a cheap cable lock through the gun. Again, is that a cable lock? Is that a device that I say everyone should use all the time? No, it's not great for a lot of things, but it is good if you're in the guest room and you're worried that you're going to be downstairs at cocktail hour and Someone's teenager is going to come upstairs and get into your bag or your luggage or who the heck knows. Keep in mind, as with anything where a lot of money is on the line, big business means a lot of people want to sell you something. And we see this in the world of everyone's kit and their accessories and all the the Gucci extra accessories you can put on your on your rig. When someone's going to make money off you, there's going to be no end of advertising and options that are out there on the market. Uh, So you like these are scenes from SHOT Show as I go there every year, in addition to seeing a billion new variations on the old dumb stuff like here's 18 new AR-15s. Okay, I don't care. Uh, There's plenty of stuff I'm interested in in gun storage, right? There's new storage solutions and new locks all the time. Take a walk down your sporting goods store aisles. You'll see a number of different lock boxes and gun safes and vaults and so forth. Or like I said, I was literally picking up a bunch of hardware for a client. And I was at my supplier's showroom and I went, oh, let me go take a few photos. These photos are going to come into play later on because they're never going to miss an opportunity to say, hey, do you need a safe? We got some safes. It's good money. Good money. Absolutely. The material that goes in them is expensive, but it's not that expensive, right? Safes are a good profit margin. Many of these products for gun storage and gun protection are pretty weak, right? So a lot of them are sort of included for free, depending. I used to live back East, right? In New Jersey, Philadelphia, other places. When you bought a gun, you got a little pamphlet 
that said, hey, remember, always lock your gun up. And it, it came with a free lock, right? Project Child Safe is a huge one of these sort of enterprises that make, and I'm not throwing shade at the idea, right? If someone buys a gun, give them a lock with the gun. If it's, if these locks cost like a dollar, right? And that's about the value you get out of them. Uh, they are very, very pickable. They are, you know, this is me using really cheap kind of like rake tools here. And with a couple jiggles, I mean, that lock is open. Is that going to protect, you know, a toddler from using the gun? I mean, yeah. Is it going to protect it from a determined teenager? Mm, probably not. And if you look at the paperwork that, that comes with these, like you'll see that, you know, this firearm locking device is only deterring it is particularly against children. It's not really intended to withstand forced entry or a determined aggressor. They say that in the paperwork. Where it gets muddy, and this is where, again, I, I want people to think with a little bit more of a bright line determination here. These are products, and you'll see plenty of products in this next section that are marketed. You'll, these are vaults and gun safes, pistol safe. They are not safes. There are products that exist in this intermediate zone that I would really just call gun lock boxes. They're a little more than like you're at the bake sale and here's your cash box, right? Yes, sure, it prevents someone from just sort of like, whoop, just going to grab that money or grab that pistol. But it's it's not really going to determine, like, stop a determined attacker. Like, for example, this one, Vault, Vault Tech. Got a little uh, fingerprint reader on there, it's got a keypad. But like so many of these, it's got an override key. I don't know how many people here know a great deal about lock picking, but a lot of these override locks are terrible. This is a wafer lock. If you're not familiar with what a wafer lock is, it's a filing cabinet lock. You know, it's, it's a complete Junko lock that you would see on something like this plastic shield that prevents arguments about the air conditioning in an office. This is attacking a wafer lock. You get yourself some rake tools or some jigglers, just kind of Stick it in. You saw me do this with the, the padlock, the cable lock, right? Scrub, 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 turn, 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 ka-chunk. That's using a rake or using a little jiggler key. Stick this in, rattle it around, very unsophisticated attack, and then boom, it's open. And I've done this to plenty of products, sometimes on store shelves and on the trade show floor at SHOT Show. But you'll see these. You'll see, like, here's a little gun vault, little mechanical override lock. This one's by Stack On, big name in the industry, right? little wafer lock. It's got an RFID fob, which you also could or couldn't trust, depending on how much you want to talk about RFID. But again, like they all, every, this is like a standard design. You, if you have even an electronic lock, oh, you got to have that override key. We don't want anybody, you know, getting locked out of their guns. Don't bury your head in the sand, Mr. Police Officer, with your long gun in your cruiser. Buy our product. It's a great product. Here it is with a wafer lock and a very unsophisticated one at that. Uh, again, this is another amazing one. This one operates with a handcuff key. Not a, now, I actually like this more because officers and the people on the job actually tend to know handcuffs are not security devices. They are temporary restraints. They are to prevent someone from just literally bolting away. Uh, having your long gun in the cruiser, at least it's secured by something. So if somebody smashes a window, they can't just grab it but it's not meaningfully secured, right? I can teach anybody to pick handcuffs with a paper clip. This is another you know, shotgun storage solution, right? And this is me just shimming it open using a bit of flexible plastic material here. So if I stick it in, perchum, pop that open. Okay. Again, is it better than nothing? Sure, compared, literally compared to nothing, I guess it's a little better, but judge your situation, judge your threat model. More terrible solutions. This one, the override lock, again, very popular in the industry. Tubular locks. Why are they popular? Because they are cheap and they look interesting. If you're not familiar with tubular locks, they have been around for decades. They have been considered insecure for decades. Uh, here's a buddy of mine, lock picking lawyer, if you watch him on YouTube, and he's talking about manually picking a tubular lock, just applying a little bit of turning pressure like you would with most types of lock picking and pressing on the pins and feeling those pins click into place. Uh, it's neat, he's actually doing this to one of the original kryptonite bike locks, the original U-lock uh, that they ever made. Now you can do it manually like that, uh, or there are automated, not automated tools, right? But there are specialized tools that make this a lot easier. 
uh, frankly, nearly instantaneous. Uh, little tubular pick, stick it in the lock, give it a little positive pressure, turn, 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 turn. And within moments, you're going to see this will drop right open. And most of these safes, most of these electronic gun safes, if they're using a tubular lock, not only would that pop it open, but it usually wouldn't set off any alarms or any audit you know, reports if, if your gun safe even supports that because it's just, it's just a mechanical override, right? This is a really neat tool because in addition to picking the lock, you actually impression the key. So now you could either make a, a fresh key and always have a backup key. You could come back or you could just use this pick over and over and over. So there's plenty of footage of me doing this to these types of products. Uh, this is potato vision footage. This is decades, a decade or old now. Uh, this was a talk I gave at the DEF CON conference years ago talking about gun storage devices. So there we are, you know, instantly open right there. Another one, the, the bio box by Smart Biometrics. Now the biometrics were not that great. The mechanical lock was even worse. A couple turns and again, boop, open just like that. And you can tell, I mean, companies come and companies go. Uh, this is the exact same product on a store shelf now. Uh, it's just made by somebody new. The company who makes it in China just resold it and then found a different distributor. That's, that's very common with a lot of these products. These brands kind of come and go, but they're not making these products. They're sourcing almost all of them from China. There's that tubular lock again and again. A uh, buddy of mine named Dave, uh, there's a channel called Handgun Safe Research on YouTube and Vimeo. So yeah, like just video after video of these middle tier products, these sort of lockbox products failing miserably. If you have an infant, a toddler, sure, helpful. If you have a curious teenager, like your teenager's got the internet, they've got YouTube and they've got time and tools, exactly, time and tools. This is kind of neat. This is, now, this is interesting, right? This is a display, but it's for retail. And yes, it is a little tubular lock. You might say, oh, it's a tubular lock, very pickable. Deviant wouldn't like that. Honestly, I think this is kind of neat for display in stores. That store we saw in Texas where they just ran in and started swiping everything. If the guns were locked up with this, imagine how much harder that would have been if they had to fiddly bit around for 30 seconds or a minute with every other gun much more challenging to do. So in the right situation, maybe it works for you. Here's a wall safe, fancy, fancy electronicals. I don't know how good they are, but I do know that tubular lock isn't any good. Multi-wheel, multi-wheel locks, right? Maybe you've got a little storage box like this. There are plenty of them out there. This is how you would attack them if you're curious. Most multi-wheel locks can be decoded. This goes for your key storage box. If you have one like on the outside of your house, perhaps. Uh, you take a thin tool of metal, slip it down into the lock body, sort of in between the wheels and the housing, and you start rotating the wheels. This is, a, this is the actual technique that we teach covert entry guys, right? So if you're teaching a covert entry technician, here's what you got to do. You feel this, you'll feel a little notch or you'll feel a little flat spot on the wheel. Do it on the next wheel. You're not necessarily finding the combination when you do this, but what you are doing is lining up the internal components on the wheel hub with one another. And once those wheels are all lined up, which takes all of a minute, then you can just advance the wheels in concert with one another, step by step by step. And you walk them around 10 positions, trying the release each time. And there you go. So if you've ever seen any of these products like this, this is a double whammy. It's a multi-wheel lock, so super decodable. And it's a TSA key, so super vulnerable. If you're not familiar, again, I talk about flying with firearms, right? Uh, the TSA keys are pretty compromised. I mean, you can literally go on Amazon and buy the TSA number seven is the, the most common TSA key. It's what all new products use nowadays. Uh, so, you know, there you go. 12 bucks. Open yourself a lot of luggage. Open yourself some gun storage. On SHOT Show's floor, on their trade show floor, a lot of the guns are locked up with cables so you don't just run away with them. And there's a like, little retro M203, and it's locked up with a TSA lock. Uh, now, again, is this secure? Is this not secure? It's all relative. It would be kind of obvious if in the middle of a trade show, somebody just tried to waltz away carrying an M203, right? Uh, in 2019, there was a guy at the Las Vegas trade show who stole like 65 guns and some suppressors. 
uh, when the trade show was being broken down. That's that's some brass ones. Uh, he got caught because he was an idiot. He instantly tried to sell them in the city, and he was trying. He was like tried to buy firing pins, which they didn't have, and then tried to sell them the same weekend. Uh, so yeah, that guy's doing a, a small jump in the in the in the joint. But let's compare what we've been showing you just now, right? Sort of cheap, not not bad, just cheap and limited solutions. Let's compare them with gun safes, right? What I would actually call a safe to some degree. Again, no shortage of industry suppliers wanting to sell you a safe for your valuables. Here are some brands, you know, like when, when you see Winchester, right? This is a big name. It's not like Winchester's making this. These are all rebranded. So other companies are, are lending their name, they're, they're licensing their name to work with other known manufacturers of safes. Whenever you have a safe, you want to know more about it, swing the door open, look for a sticker with all kinds of information in there. And you notice in these slides, I keep putting the word safe in quotes because everything you've seen in the last five to six slides has not been a safe in, in my world, right? Most of the things you see sold as safes, even big heavy steel boxes are residential security containers. This is an interesting, like what is it? I mean, it looked like a safe to me. What is an RSC? All right, not gonna get too deep. And again, I don't wanna run too long uh, because boy, if I, I got a lot of material for you here to, to talk about some standards. I don't wanna drag you into this, but if you're curious, right? Run as okay. long as you need to, Dave. Well, I mean, we've got people after me tonight, don't we? Who's, who, who's speaking after me? I don't wanna eat into, we've got Lonnie coming up. No, is that, uh, is that tomorrow? That's tomorrow. Oh. Yeah, it's, oh, that's tonight's tomorrow. instructors and it's Discord. And hey, all right. Fun. Well, I'm not going to be a complete jerk and take all of your time, but at least I don't have to talk quite as quickly. Thank you for letting me know there. So, safes, and I mean proper safes, right? There are actual testing standards and rating standards of construction. Let's start with cheap, you know, basic burglary safe, B-rate safe, right? It has to be basically just a container that can have a lock made of steel. A certain amount of steel. There are other classifications like BC. You see the steel gets a little thicker. There's C-rated safes, again, even thicker. But you notice there's really no tests being performed. These are construction standards. And we'll talk about the most popular construction standard as, as regard to firearm storage is like meets California DOJ standard. We'll talk about that as well. These are not really being tested and evaluated for how well they perform. Once we start getting into real heavy duty security, that's the idea of a burglar safe, a burglar rated high security safe. This is something where you have the underwriter's lab, right? Like, so you've got UL standard uh, 687 is where a lot of the high security locks are sort of, they're all into this big omnibus standard that underwriter's lab puts out. So now in addition to construction, there are actual tests being performed. They have to have certain locks. They have to try to make a hole in the, there's a testing crew and they have very specific parameters where they're trying to make a hole in this. Oh, I'm sorry, no, I apologize, I apologize. This is the hole you see here for openings in the safe. That's if you wanna wire an alarm into the safe, the hole cannot be very large. For testing, the attackers are trying to make a hole that is six inches in size. That's you know six inches square. The idea being you could remove valuables from the safe, but even how they're allowed to do it, right? If you have, let's say, what's called a TL-15 burglary rated safe. Well, that is attackers who can use hand tools, very specific hand tool set, and take 15 minutes to make a hole in the safe. There are TL-30, let's say, if the attackers have regular hand tools, the safe has to meet these construction standards. And again, the slides are all gonna be online. We're sharing this and I'm going a, a little bit of a gallop here, but the, the attackers can use a few more tools on a TL-30. They can get some power tools now, but they have 30 minutes to make a hole in the safe and through the front of the safe. There's a 30 by six standard, which means all six sides of the safe have to withstand the same amount of, you know, of attack. But you're seeing like, what kind of tools are we talking here? These, these are really interesting tests. Like the engineers at Underwriters Labs are people like me, they're safe technicians and they get the blueprints and the manufacturing plans. They're allowed to disassemble the safe. Because again, this is for much higher value 
than most of our gun collections. These are the safes you see in jewelry stores and in pawn shops and in places where criminals might actually be breaking in determined, really determined to target that environment. So someone might, in theory, buy the same safe or look at it on a showroom floor and try to figure out how it works and figure out where the drill points are. So these are technicians that know all about the safe, but they are kind of hampered. When you think about what tools they're using, these are kind of limited. I mean, that portable angle grinder is about the most advanced tool in this list. Those are TL rated safes though, hand tools only, like simple, small power tools and hand tools. Now there are further standards. There's TRTL, that's where they get to use torches. So you break out your oxy, your acetylene, your thermic lance. There's also even TXTL, where they're allowed to use up to eight ounces of nitro. So there are really crazy safes out there. Most of us will never own one of these. And in a residential environment, it's virtually unheard of. It is a very fun thing to test. I've never been a part of, of I've witnessed some of them. I've never gotten to do one because I don't work for underwriters labs. But um, yeah, like you think about people who have uber super like collections of jewelry and everything. People like that don't really keep it all in their house. A lot of these people who have like the mega rich who have in, insane Princess Anne jewelry from the heritage or whatever, that's in a vault somewhere. And they take it out for some ball gown and affairs of state, and then it goes back in the vault. But something like this, you would see this, yes, in the industry, but maybe in a gun store, or again, in a jewelry store, where they have loads of incredibly advanced and high security needs. At home, residential security containers really are what rule that market. Uh, first of all, you ever try to move one of these? It's a whole special training that you need to move safes like this around. They weigh tons. You can't put them in a lot of houses without structurally compromising the house. Residential security containers though, that's what we got here. And they do have some testing, right? RSCs are not just a, a made up baloney thing, but the testing is much lighter. It's one attacker just trying to remove valuables and they, they're using hand tools. So it is actual testing requirements here. But it's not that, again, it's not that crazy. There is something called a type two residential security container. Um, it, is, it is a little bit harder to breach. It has to be a little bit thicker built, better built, and they can use some power tools. I've never seen a type two container for sale. I think it was created to comply with some insurance standard, but like nobody, I don't, I don't know who even sells these or who makes them. They've gotta be out there somewhere, it's on the books. I mentioned California Department of Justice, right? Again, this is a construction standard. It is not a testing-based standard. Um, again, it, it basically, it's what you think. It's gotta have a metal lock, it's gotta have a lock, it's gotta have bolts. Essentially, most things comply. They say meets California DOJ because if anything is a UL rated RSC, if it's a residential security container and it can fit a firearm, it's automatically California Department of Justice approved. All right, you can just add that stamp, put that sticker there. John White asks, best lock for air travel? Uh, I'll talk about that in a bit. I think I've got some more photos, but um, I have a hard time beating my little Abloy locks. Uh, Abl and Asa Abloy is a huge company. They have a billion products. But um, Abloy Protec, like imagine the word protect, but without the final T. Uh, the Abloy Protec is what I really like. It's what I use on all my stuff. And you'll see why. I don't use the biggest, beefiest, heavy-duty locks, uh, but I use the 321. The little Abloy 321, perfectly fine for, for me on my Pelican cases, right? Now, I will mention gun safes, you know, this big thing, it's a big old safe. There are big things that are made to pretty poor tolerances, like those little lock boxes, that's thin sheet metal. There are big containers for long guns that are just thin sheet metal, right? This is a cabinet. This is not a safe. This is just bent sheet metal. I wouldn't put anything of real value in this if it were my job to protect guns. Am I saying that every cabinet is completely worthless? Not entirely. Again, I don't work for any of these companies and I have my criticisms of some of their marketing, but like Secure It is a company that basically makes the nicest gun cabinet you can buy. It, it's, it's like six hundo and it prevents covert access, right? It prevents the idea of someone smashing in and just like, uh, sorry, not smashing in. It prevents the idea of someone 
finesse their way in and like stealing, like a teenager maybe stealing your guns, depending on how you're using the lock. Will it, will it prevent someone from smashing their way in? Probably not. But if a criminal like breaks in your house and is just grabbing stuff and trying to get out of there in five minutes, it's better than nothing. I would consider this like a harm reduction approach, but it's not my personal preference. I'm saying that I definitely have my, my punk DIY roots, man. DIY solutions, I'm all for it. Job boxes, like job box, they protect far more valuable things than firearms on a lot of job environments. And they are out in public. They're out there overnight. People, you know, try to get in, you know, get in them, try to steal things, steal power tools. They are exposed environments, man. You can turn one of these into a gun storage solution. A buddy of mine sent me photos, right? So this is a job box that has been turned into a firearm vault, essentially. It's got the ammo in there. It's got the mags and everything. And it's going to be fine. Like this is much better than a, a cheapo thin sheet metal cabinet, in my opinion. And it's cheaper to make. It's cheaper to maintain. I think it's great. I love these photos that somebody sent along. What are they using? They're just using kind of big, beefy, you know, just big, beefy shackle. Not particularly pick resistant locks. I mean, Abbas, I do like Abbas. They make a, they make a fairly decent product. You're going to get some spool pins in there. And it's at a weird recessed angle. I would have a hard time getting in there to pick that, honestly. So that's why I wanted to include these. Somebody wrote to me and they said, hey, check out what I did. And I said, hell yeah. Think outside the box, man. Or think, you know, inside the job box. Quick one on, I said, you know, the different cabinets, they have to have a lock on them, right? Uh, was that a car 98 on top? I think it might have been. Let's see here. Who's got, uh, who's got better eyes than me? I don't know if that is a, if that is a Mauser or not. I'll have to ask Ian later. I don't know. Uh, really quickly regarding safe locks, not the safe itself, but safe locks have their own ratings. If you are curious, we're not going to deep dive into this. This gets much more into manipulation. But anyone who can tell me, right, in the service, you got two Louis here, first lieutenant and second lieutenant. Who's higher ranked? Say out, shout it out or type it in the chat. This is the audience participation point. There you go. David said, it. yes. Um, first Louis, first lieutenant outranks second lieutenant. It is the same with safe lock ratings. So group one, group two is what you often hear referred to on. These are mechanical safe dials, right? Group one safe locks are better than group two safe locks. They are designed to resist actual skilled attackers. They're designed to take much longer to, to try to manipulate open because their dialing tolerances are much, much tighter. Now, that makes them much more expensive, harder to make. So I got to love the free market solution where they made up another standard. There's, you know, there's group one and group two, very different mechanisms on the inside, much more advanced than what's called a little accelerator bearing and a kinetic arm on the group one safe. The 2937 is what we currently use in the uh, DOD standard for armory locks, if you're curious. The group two, the S&G 6700 series, I mean, that's just what, you know, your average like mechanical safe lock might be on your house if you have a safe in your house right now. So there is another standard though, right? The, the, there was market pressure that resulted in the creation of an intermediate, group two M. It can basically be thought of as a group two safe lock, same quality of manufacture, but it has some anti-manipulation technology that makes it a lot harder for someone like me to manipulate it open. And it's, it's really neat. What did they, you know, you can see what they changed here. So in our group two M, like it looks like the same exact lock, right? But the wheels, the actual, and we're not going to get deep into safe manipulation, but the wheel pack, you can see it has these little false gates in random spots on the wheel. There's also something called an eccentric roller in the uh, nose of this lever. Again, if you want to know more about it, we have time, ask me in the Q&A. It's a really neat solution. They didn't have to change the quality of the build. They just made it perform kind of funny, and it makes it a lot harder to manipulate. Uh, so yeah, it can. There's you can you can see in this chart, it it totally fits a market niche. Uh, there's one more spot on this chart that also exists that I haven't shown you yet, and that is Group One R. And you look at it and it says, well, it looks just like Group One. What's the difference? It is resistant to one other type of attack. Uh, and again, I'm going to turn to the audience here. Who remembers if you saw me talk about this before? What is the additional type of attack that Group One R safe locks are designed to mitigate against? They're not manipulation-based attacks. They're not forced entry attacks. 
Not explosive attacks, although that would be kind of cool. Explosives, we think much more in the rating of the safe container. Not electronic, no. They, the R stands for radiological, almost had it, radiation. Radiological, it's for X-raying. Uh, during the Cold War, this was a much bigger threat. So we were worried about people with portable X-rays looking through the lock and manipulating it and giving themselves cancer at the same time. Uh, so what they did is they made a lot of parts out of plastics and different polymers. So yeah, you see, it's just really neat. They, they made the wheel pack resistant to X-rays, uh, often Delarin. Uh, it's very, very high stiffness, very low friction. It's, it's very good dimensional stability if you don't work with a lot of polymers. If, if you 3D print, you can get so down the hole of like how different polymers perform under different conditions. Speaking of, uh, they don't do that anymore because it was discovered that polymers do melt under excessive heat. So if you got the safe hot enough, the, the wheel pack would just kind of like, or you could inject uh, acid through a very tiny hole in a crevice and just melt the wheels. So they've moved back to uh, to metal wheels. You know, this is our this is one of the more common final generations of mechanical lock that the government used on classified safes for years. And now everything is electromechanical. Electromechanical. So yeah, um, this this is I said this earlier. The twenty nine thirty seven. This is the standard lock on all field safes, weapons containers. Uh, in the G again, I'm, I'm a GSA safe technician, so I've got to service these and install them a lot. And if you want a good safe, a mechanical only safe lock at home, could not go wrong. A little more expendy, but if you want a great one, gets a thumbs up from me. A great shotgun follower is made from Delrin. I could see that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Now, safe locks, though. Many of you go to the store and you oh, I want to buy this gun safe. Looks all good. It's not going to have a mechanical dial. Very popular these days to have an electronic safe lock because why? Easier to use, faster. Just remember, you know, your somebody's birth date or something like that, which, you know, we can get into what, what's a good or bad uh, safe combination. But yeah, let's think about electronic safe lock. So here we've got one again, co-branded. This is a container made by, I don't know, probably AMSEC or somebody like that, but it's branded as Winchester because they lent their name for licensing. The lock itself, the lock is made by Sargent and Greenleaf. We've seen their name come up a lot. This is an s &G, has one of their electronic series. Uh, here's the NL Rotobolt. Uh, NL locks are from Italy. Same idea, SecuRam. Uh, this is a Californian company, but all their stuff's 100% made in China. I don't know enough about their product line yet, but a lot of their stuff does not quite look as great to me. I need to do some testing. If you ever see an electronic safe lock that has sort of these like contacts on the front of them. Uh, you have a Lagarde. This is Lagarde 33E. Those are contact points for battery. If the obviously electronic locks, if the battery dies, what are you gonna do? So the Lagarde handles that by having, you can like touch a battery to the outside and power it up, operate, operate it. You can always tell the Sergeant and Greenleaf, uh, their 6120 is their electronic lock. Not only is that prominent s and logo there, but there's always a light bulb button because there's a little dome light that shines on it when you need to operate it in the dark. A lot of these have been subject to some interesting testing, including by our firm. This is my buddy Bobak at the company. This is his workbench. So again, we don't want to get super into the weeds, but if you are curious about this stuff, there's something called differential power analysis. What is differential power analysis? Well, in, in, a, in a nutshell, and anyone who's an EE or anybody who wants to tell me all the ways I'm wrong about this, if you are doing computational things with digital logic, it costs more voltage, minuscule, but it costs more voltage to read a one out of memory than a zero. And if you know that, and if you know about the out, like how the safe operates, if you know its code, you could in theory sniff the power lines, you can actually, you use what's called a sense resistor on the power lines and you hook up an oscilloscope like this and you can, you can literally watch data operations happening. When the safe powers up, you know, it's, the memory is volatile. When the safe is powered down, it doesn't have the code in memory. The code is stored on non-volatile flash memory because you programmed your user code. The safe wakes up, it has to read that code out of memory to be able to compare it to whatever the user is putting in. If you can sniff that read process, you can then get the master code. And it's actually been made a turnkey thing. This is, again, this is a product that exists that you don't talk about often, but I can, I can buy this from Lockmasters 
I'm one of the authorized parties, right? Lockmasters makes what they just call the little black box. Uh, it works on Lagarde locks earlier than 2014. Uh, it works on Safeguard. It works on the old SMG. Uh, like I think up to like 2000, this, this worked on the SMG uh, 6120s. And this is what it looks like. Most of these locks, by the way, the way it, you say, well, don't you need access to the power? Well, remember, everyone's afraid of the lock dying. So you need, where's the power coming from? Well, if you take the lock dial like off the safe, there's going to be wire. The, it needs to get power on the unit that you're about to manipulate. So the power wires are there. Sometimes the battery is right there on the front of the lock itself. Many times it's just a little header cable. You can take, take off the, the keypad and then you plug that cable right into the little black box. It will power up the safe. It will literally do the power analysis, get the code, and then input the code and just unlock the safe. And you, it's just like that. It's, it's like watching Angelina Jolie and Gone in 60 Seconds, just plugging something into a Ferrari and being like, start the car, boom, electronics defeated. So yeah, it's, it's really wild so to see. Stuck. One more, my buddy Roy. It is super so he's powerful. putting, what is he putting on the front of the safe? He's putting a giant it's magnet right on the front of this safe. You can pop and then that safe that he was going to use for some important things, including some guns made by Sentry safe there. Well, how does this work? It's just a solenoid, right? So he's activating the solenoid by just putting a big honking magnet inside of a rag so you don't get it stuck. He just slapped a magnet on the front of it. That's completely viable attack against a number of electronic lock systems. One more electronic attack, not against the electronic dial, it's against a mechanical dial. This is an auto dialer. There are, an, there are a few of them in the field. This is an older generation product, the ITL 2000. Uh, the Combi is, the, the QX4 Combi is made by Lockmasters uh, nowadays. And it is what you could imagine. It, Magnet mounts right on the front of the safe. It's got a jaw that clamps right on the dial. Uh, the combi actually is run off a tablet, so you can give it parameters. Try these numbers first. Here's everyone's birthday in the family. Here's the address. Uh, try those. When those don't work, just brute force the whole thing. And it'll just try every combination of manageable. Just dial, 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 dial. Uh, they're about 2000 bucks if you're curious. And again, the, these are out there. People can buy them. You clamp it on. You let it run for a few hours. Maybe you get lucky, boom, opens right up, or you let it run for a couple of days, but it'll get through all the viable combinations in about a day and a half to two days, depending on run speed. Now, here's one that students made. Literally, these are some, there are students that just made one to like, I'm gonna to try to make my own because I don't wanna pay $2,000. So they made it with a stepper motor. Another big thing, are we still are we still hanging? Again, I'm like pouring stuff out at you. I feel like I'm running a little long here. How we, how we do it? Rock and roll, rock and roll, you're good. Excellent, excellent. So a bigger risk to a lot of people is not like theft and intentional, you know, damage and such, but unintentional disasters like fire, flood, things like that. Fire, especially. We see a lot of this on safe ratings, right? So if you open the safe, that sticker on the inside, a lot of times you see, oh, this is rated fire rated 30 minutes. You notice 1400 degrees is on this sticker. 1400 shows up a lot on these stickers. Uh, this is a 45 minute uh, rated safe and exceeds California DOJ requirements. Awesome. 75 minutes on the big daddy. Woo, amazing. Is that good? Is that bad? Why, why 1400, by the way? Most structure fires, uh, most residential structure fires do not exceed 12 to 1300 degrees. So 1400 became sort of this target zone where if the safe can withstand that, oh, good job, safe. But we'll talk about this, right? So look at this one, 120 minutes. Wow, amazing. These all sound very impressive. But notice these rating stickers don't have any, like most of them don't have anything from Underwriters Lab. The, the safe sticker right here, made by Rhino. Rhino's a big sort of, they're all, this is a Chinese importer, right? Uh, but like UL listed, it, it complies with a residential security container standard but this, the fire rating doesn't say anything about Underwriters Lab. That's a separate sticker that they just put on there. These are self-tests in the industry. Uh, some of them are just freaking made up, in my opinion. I don't think they're actually really testing anything. This is, this is a great example, though. Here we got it, right? Fire test, 1,400 degrees, 90 minutes. That sounds great. They should definitely be able to put a fire out in my house in no less than 90 minutes. Look at this graph right? Look at this curve on the graph. 
What it's showing is that if the outside of the safe is 1400 degrees, the inside of the safe, once 90 minutes is reached, will be 1400 degrees. At that point, everything in the safe is on fire. And it wasn't in good shape for many of those minutes leading up to that point either. True fire rating, right? Fire classification by the underwriter's lab has a class designation. That's the internal temperature shall not exceed, and it's no 1400 degrees. And then a duration designation, right? This is how long in a 1400 degree environment the inside of the safe will stay below a certain temperature. So we see this is a class 350 or a class 250 safe, right? So the, the actual cl class 350 is far and away the most common. Let's talk about that. 350 degrees beyond that paper starts to become unreadable. It turns brown, it curls up, it gets flaky and falls apart. So if you can keep your paper under 350, it is generally safe even in a fire on the outside of the safe. If you are like me, sure, I've got some paper, like folding money in my safe, but I've got other stuff in my safe too. I've got backup hard drives and you know, nobody really uses floppies anymore, but a lot, how many of you use backup like thumb drives? USB kind of, you know, you got RAM, you got a solid state drive. Solid state memory is toast beyond 150. There is a classification of 150 degrees. That's that's one of the class and 125 if you're still hacking the planet with floppies, I guess. But yeah, if you have electronic media in your safe and you're worried about a fire, it better be class 150 for one hour or two hour test designation, right? So how do they achieve that? How do safe designs make resistance to fire on the outside? Because metal, like safes are made of metal. Metal conducts heat. You can have a super thick slab of steel and it's just basically a heat sink, but heat's eventually gonna get through there. So the cheap way, the way that again, your boat most bargain basement type of safe, basically it's drywall, right? It's sheetrock. And sheetrock, sure, it's kind of ceramic-y, powdery. It's going to not conduct heat very well, but sheetrock's kind of a garbage material. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. It attracts moisture and humidity. It can build up mold. Why is it used? Because it's cheap. It will do the job of protecting you from fire, but it's not great. And this was, again, I was just at Intermountain Lock today, and I took a photo in, the, in their lobby, and they were showing, AMSEC was showing different, because that last one, this, was, this is an AMSEC safe, and AMSEC has cheap safes that they make, like other manufacturers, also defined as our bargain basement products. But this is, you know, something they call dry light ceramic. I, to me, it looks like freaking cheap concrete, in my opinion which plenty of safes will use concrete as a fire insulator. That is a thing. Uh, the best safes, the, be the really good ones out there, they will use something called ceramifiber. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that's used in kilns and pizza ovens when they get constructed. So if you're curious what's inside of a really high rated underwriters lab tested fire safe, it's probably ceramoboard, ceramifiber. If you open your safe and it has this sort of gaskety stuff around the door seal, that could just be a rubber gasket. But if it's kind of stiff, if it almost feels like a little bit thicker than a fridge magnet kind of thickness, um, that might be polyosol, might be fire seal. Fire seal is a substance that when it gets hot, it'll swell up and it's designed to seal the, the seams of the safe to prevent leakage of heat and also to prevent ingress of water. Um, depending on where your safe, if you have your safe in the basement, and your house is on fire and you know you've got to you live in a town with good civil services and they, they show up and they start pouring water all over your house even if it's just one room of the house that had some fire damage and they get the fire out you might have a foot of standing water in your basement and like that will ingress into a safe and then it, maybe you're not allowed in the house for 48 hours and now your guns are all just sitting in the freaking water so fire seal can kind of help you out there it is kind of interesting to see, uh, you know, like impact testing, right? This was a, this looks like a comical thing. Like Liberty Safe does a lot of funny stuff in their ads, dropping a, a cement block onto the safe. But honestly, impact testing is a thing when the underwriter's lab tests fire, fire ratings. Not only do they heat the bejesus out of the safe in a kiln, they then haul it up with a crane and they drop it to, to simulate, they drop it onto a pile of rubble to simulate it falling through the floor of a fire-wrecked building. 
and this the safe shall not pop open um, yeah it's really amazing stuff but keep this kind of thing in mind of what your safe can and can't do um i don't know how many you saw this story right like this director who was this multi-millionaire guy in the hollywood hills and he was like i don't trust banks and okay i most of us have kind of gotten over that hump these days and trust banks. But what did he do? He kept his stuff in a fireproof safe. No, he, he kept his life savings in a couple of like cheap fire, you know, stack on fireboxes or some BS. That's not going to work if literally your home is, this wasn't like, oh God, the, the home is on fire, call the fire department. This was evacuate the mountainside. The mountain is on fire, like a wildfire that ripped through the countryside. That is devastatingly hot, way hotter than a structure fire. And it went on for days. There's no emergency services getting in there with the exception of maybe trying to dump some you know, goo from a helicopter. So yeah, of course it was all gone. Like nothing is gonna survive that in a meaningful sense, not a residential security container. Let's talk about ammo, by the way. We haven't talked about ammo just yet. Do you store it in the safe, out of the safe, away from the guns? That's a whole different conversation regarding what type of kids you have, what kind of other people in the house. I can tell you, this is basically what we do. I mean, you're looking at our basement right here. We have a bazillion D ammo boxes that I'm Mr. Neat Freak. So they're all labeled with what caliber they are. And they're all just on a giant, you know, intermetro shelf. And each one of them has a desiccant pack inside of there. You can get, you know, metal tins of desiccant. These, they're good for maybe, well, up here, it's a little humid. Uh, we got a lot of moisture in the air in the Northwest, but I'm good for three to four months. Basically every quarter, I pull all these out. I put them on a cookie sheet. I bake them in the oven. Silica gel evaps off, put them back in all the boxes just fine. In the safes themselves, uh, I do have these ever dry kind of units. They, again, they're just silica poly, like they, they're absorbent. They're, they're desiccant material. Then you can plug them in the wall and they'll, they'll cook, they'll evap off. Now somebody says, Eric says, use them. Yeah, if you use them, they're perfectly fine. I didn't realize, I was, this is one of those dummy moments I had. I said, man, what I should do is I, that I, I could run power inside the safe and then I could like make an Arduino with code. So every six months, it just turns them on and turns them off and cooks them. I never have to deal with it. And I was talking to my friend about that. He's like, I want you to say that again slower and think about what you're saying. So what do you mean? I'm thinking of making it automated. He's like, okay, where does that, moisture go when you cook it off. I was like, well, it, it cooks off in vapor. Oh, I'm just putting it back in the safe, wouldn't I? He's like, yeah, there you go. Now you're tracking. So yeah, you can't, you can't do that. Um, if you're storing your ammunition, by the way, in the safe, like you can see, like I do have loaded mags around. I have, you know, various bandoliers on the shotguns. Uh, I don't just have magazines laying around the house because again, we have guests, we have people coming over. You don't know what some idiot's gonna do with a hammer and a nail if they're just chemically inebriated. This is the one thing that I do use those cheap tastic boxes for because they're California DOJ approved. They're in a gun storage box. When I'm traveling, I will often have my ammo in one of these. So again, if, if I'm pulled over and any lawyers watching, please tell me if I'm not setting myself up uh, properly here. If I have a gun in my car, any ammo in the car is locked in a separate container. It's not a particularly great container, but it's a lockable gun storage container. So I don't definitely think that, you know, like this one is nine bucks, nine ninety nine, And I just to prove how bad it was, I picked it while it was still on the store shelf. But you can see that's what I use when I'm traveling. So I have my ammo loaded up in a little box. I have some loaded mags, but that can easily be locked when I'm somewhere else. So yeah, someone says you use a cheap product. Absolutely. I do use a cheap product because it I'm using it to comply with the letter of the law, but I wouldn't use this in all situations. I wouldn't use this box in a situation where I meaningfully thought somebody was trying to steal what its contents were. It's not gonna protect a lot, but it will protect me legally. Uh, do you use VCI emitters in your safe? Ooh, I don't know what a VCI emitter is. If you wanna tell me what that is, I will gladly look it up. But um, is that a chemical inhibitor, something like some sort of ionizer, something that does something against rust? A chemical rust inhibitor. Ha! Oh, vapor corrosion inhibitors. Got you. Uh, no, I don't, but they are perfectly fine products. There are products like I used to make fun of them. Oh, there we got a link. I can check it out. 
So there was a product called uh, the golden rod that you would like leave down the barrel, like down the bore of your gun. Oh, neat. Disc, VCI disc. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That That's totally cool. I will definitely look into them some more and add it to the slides. So bang it. And obviously for those who can't see that there's chat going on, he's responding to chat messages. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's, it's really neat how, you know, because these are all chemical processes, right? Oxidation is a chemical process. And if you can take that oxidization process and subvert it, uh, not catalyze it, but inhibit it through other chemical processes, that's awesome. Uh, the, I used to make fun of those, like drop this in your bore and plug it in. I was like, that doesn't, the moisture's not leaving the safe, but it does keep the bore of the firearm slightly warmer at all times. So that would inhibit deposits of moisture in that one area. Uh, I'm more of a desiccant guy myself. So yeah, of course, there are, there are times I will use things that other people might make fun of because it's all about practical. Like what is practical for your needs and your specific situation? Uh, again, my personal security posture. We have the guns in gun safes. They are not the world's greatest gun safes, but they are not the only things protecting the guns. We're going to talk more about that. They're in the basement down there, right? Now, we do have home security firearms. Uh, we have them you know, in the bedroom, clamped on with a quick access. We have one on the first, the main floor of the house, back in the laundry room, clamped on. These are mechanical push button. I don't like electronic locks pretty much for anything. But uh, you know, mechanical push button, kind of simplex style, boop, swing it right open instantly. We can grab those. Uh, community defense style or have to get out of the house and maybe not come back for a while style. We have grab and go bags. My wife and I each have our own rifle bags ready to go. If you've never seen it, uh, I have a whole video about this uh, on my channel, like our personal rifle bags. Uh, they each contain our what would stoner do rifle. They each contain our like preferred defensive pistol. They each contain mags ready to go. They contain a lot of other accessories and, and you know additional force multipliers. And they each contain a little cheapo cable lock. So right, like if we have to just grab the bag and then go somewhere, well, we can legally comply with lockup requirements if we have to, because we can put cheap cable locks through the rifles and through the pistols. You've seen my, uh, my little range bag, like my little travel bag. This is the one that's most of the time with me. You've seen how that's laid out with the ammo secured there. But there's more than just the locking devices, right? So, so I think Michael may have seen my wine preservation video I'm seeing. Um, there's, there's totally new stuff I'm doing with chemical inhibition of the oxygenation. There's, there's this, oh my God, Michael, you're going to love the latest wine series. But the big thing, right? It, safes don't exist in a vacuum. They don't exist in isolation. You're safe as even with those high-end burglary safes, the nice one, like 15, 30 minutes is what they're rated for, right? They are only good if you have the ability to detect potential intrusion and respond. So having some sort of security system, having some kind of monitoring, right? Having cameras on the outside of your house, having cameras on the inside of your house, having any sort of sensors that let you know something is going on that you need to be aware of set off the alarm, call the authorities, get back home and confront that threat, call the neighbor, something. Monitoring is just as important as the actual lock product if you have high value assets, right? So we plenty of us talk about house alarms, right? If you have a house alarm, that's part of the equation. It starts blaring and going off when a criminal breaks in, they're not gonna spend 20, 30 minutes trying to destroy your safe if they think the cops are gonna be there in 10. There are monitoring devices that go just inside. I don't know where that Fauci prayer candle is. My buddy of mine, uh, that's his, his camera. So I said, I need a picture of this one brand of camera. I'm going to talk about brands of camera as well. Uh, this is interesting. Securam, again, uh, I don't know a ton about the company. Uh, they make this safe monitor. It's supposed to just go inside your safe. And if certain conditions are met, it will, I don't know if it yells at you or sends you a message. I know that uh, this thing exists. Uh, I think it exists, SimTech. I don't know if they've gone out of business or they're still around. I think it was a Kickstarter. And I bought one, I checked it out, uh, talked to the guy who made it. So it is, it's a neat little thing. It's shaped like an oddball spaceship, but you pair it with an app and you set it up with you know cell service and everything. And it's got a little antenna. So if anybody, if it's a motion sensor, right? If it, light, sound, et cetera, it will send alerts and say, hey, someone's in your safe right now, man. What's going on? There's some movement in here. Uh, speaking of motion sensors in your safe, these lights, 
they are wicked cheap. They are really useful. Uh, the inside of your safe, generally kind of dark and annoying. These last forever on a few AAA or I think, yeah, I think it's AAA batteries. You open the safe, you move your hand and instantly everything is lit up. Uh, I love them. Look for them on Amazon if you have a gun safe. But ultimately, you know, like networked cameras, that's, that's what a lot of us are moving to. Uh, it's definitely something I recommend. It's something that is a big part of the security of any properties that Tara and I have. And it's kind of neat. You can, you can get networked cameras that look uh, not like cameras, right? So we have old smartphones laying around. Oh, yeah. So the Alfred camera app, uh, there's the Haven app that uh, Snowden and some other people worked on. So these, these are like little, they, they're, they're just hidden cameras, right? So even when I'm on the road in hotels, I have hidden cameras in my hotel rooms. And they will alert me if something's going on, if I'm not in the room and I can always dump the footage and check it out later to see, see what's going on, right? And of course, we have been using canines as uh, guards and sentinels for quite a while. So if you've got a dog, you know, good on you. Again, criminals do not like to deal with dogs. So ultimately, what do I think? I mean, we, we've just spent more, pretty much an hour or so talking about all this different data and I'm giving you all these standards. And it's if you're you want to nerd out about this, there's a lot of, you know, de, you know, you can get way into the weeds. But some people they're like, oh my God, I live in the age of no free time and top 10 lists. Give me your takeaways. Okay. Again, I don't work for any of these companies whatsoever. These brands are not awful. You know, Liberty, American Security, Gardall, Fort Knox. These are brands that generally make a decent product and they have market share because of that fact. The end all be all though, is do your research and look for something that is UL listed, even if it's just a residential security container. If it is UL listed, if you're, if you're curious, there's UL listed, there's UL classified, there's UL recognized. Uh, UL recognized stands for, it has to do with processes, uh, like production methods and so forth, not complete products. Um, UL classified has to do with very limited testing against specific hazards. Almost all of your fire ratings that you're ever going to see, uh, they're going to be UL classified. But the device, the actual enclosure, that's the UL listed. That means it passed the requirements and it has a listing number. Like you can look up in Underwriters Labs index, like this exact product passed under this date. And this is, this is how the testing went. If you see a little letter C, uh, that's because it is, uh, applies to Canada. Uh, if you see U.S., it applies to the U.S. and Canada. If you don't see anything, it's just the United States. So yeah, like if you're super serious, check that out. So this was that same showroom that I was in this morning. And I took a couple pictures for this reason. Look at this. We got 45 minutes of fire protection. No UL rating at all. Here we have 45 minutes as well, but this one is rated by ETL is the European equivalent of UL. So yes, this is an actual insurance rating. And the other one was not. If you're still confused, if you're still like, I don't know, what should I do? If you're in doubt, follow the 10% rule, right? What is the 10% rule? If you're trying to protect assets that are, let's say, $15,000, and you put them in a container that costs you a tenth of that, no one's going to think you're a crazy person, right? And the flip side, if you have a million dollars worth of assets, think about putting them in about $100,000 worth of security. Now that can be containers, that can be electronic monitoring, that can be insurance on top of that, but your total security posture might cost you about 10% of, of the asset. That's just a thing that, that's just right off the top we gotta deal with in this world. Uh, home monitoring, super cheap and functional. There are a lot of brands out there that you may have heard of. Uh, Arlo is, is a really very terrific and super simple to set up option. Uh, it's probably among the cheapest choices you can get. Nest is also pretty cheap. Uh, of course, Nest, uh, you're stuck integrating to the Google ecosystem. So Google does have access to anything going on. Uh, we have Nest cameras in some of our properties. We have them hard switched. So when we're home, uh, they, are, they are powered off. When we're gone, we switch them on. Uh, the one in the middle, though, that's the one you saw photos of. Uh, that was the Fauci candle photo as well. Wise. I really like Wise. Uh, they're a very cool company. They have very, I really like them a lot. Ubiquity got a lot of attention for sort of basically buying influencers on the internet. Uh, I'm not saying Ubiquity is bad. In fact, it's, it's quite good gear. It's just very expensive. Uh, Simply Safe. Simply Safe is a pile of poo. 
Uh, there's a reason, there's a lot of reasons you can ask me if you want. Uh, I would not use them for literally anything. Like all good realtors, location, location, location. What does it distill down to? Well, think about what your needs are. Do you need a gun in the bedroom? Do you want to put your guns down in the basement where they're harder to get? You can bolt down into the concrete. Maybe you're getting a safe that you literally couldn't put in the bedroom because of weight considerations. Maybe your home isn't weight rated anywhere. The only safe place is like the garage. You have a slab in the garage. Most folk these days in America, we move like every six to seven years. That's the average now. Moving a safe is a chore, right? If it's in the garage, a lot easier to move. Consider firefighting, right? If your home is on fire, a garage is a structure that's probably gonna withstand fire pretty well and could be accessible and they could put out the fire in the garage much more easily than in other parts of the house. These are all factors that come into play. Now, if your safe is in the garage, I think this is funny. This is called a safe cloak. Uh, it makes, you know, from a distance, if you have your garage door open, neighbors walking by, it looks kind of like a big wood grain filing cabinet. Is, is it a security device? No, it's a little bit of obscurity, but I think it's a neat idea. Or maybe you're just right out in the open. Uh, this is a friend of mine, Penelope. This is her place in Colorado. And like, she's got a gun wall. A lot of her friends there have gun walls like the, and some of these are defensive firearms. They need to be able to grab and go, right? Like this is, uh, this is if you've heard of, of the Unicorn Ranch, right? Tenacious Unicorn Ranch, like they've had threats from the fash out there. So they, they walk patrol and they have their kit and they have their rifles ready to grab. This is America. So many of us have guns in many places, uh, maybe buried under the ground or lost in a boating accident. So again, you do you, you think about what you need. Uh, if you're, on the road, if you're staying in hotels a lot, this pandemic will eventually get managed and we will be all traveling again. Uh, be aware of risks like the underdoor tool. If you're, again, if you're not familiar with breaking into hotel rooms, I've talked about this before. Super cheap, simple tools like this. This is, again, at SHOT Show. And I'm showing people at a room party like how with a rod and a string, I can get into a hotel room really easily. So. What, is, what do I do on the road? People asked me about this. I mean, I have Pelican cases and someone asked in the chat earlier, like, what do I like for flying with and storing my luggage in hotels? I like Abloy Protec locks. Um, they, they are the ones that I use. Not these super big and beefy ones, honestly. Uh, the ones I use are smaller because I don't need to, to just, I'm not guarding against someone with a giant set of bolt cutters in my hotel room. I'm guarding against someone, maybe like a hotel employee, coming in, grabbing something and leaving. Uh, no, I do not trust hotel safes. Again, we're going a little fast because you're being very generous with time, but I don't wanna take you all night on this. Uh, if you're not familiar, most hospitality safes have a little mechanical override. If you look at your hotel safe, it probably has a little Jesus, brass plaque or a little badge on that's the front of it. Worthless. That contains the, that, that's what conceals the override lock. Most of them are terrible. I don't like to use hotel. The reason the hotel safes exist, by the way, it's a liability thing. Uh, if something is stolen from a hotel room, most areas, the legislation is that if the hotel offered a security enclosure, it is on the guest to use it. So that's why every hotel room has a safe in it, uh, because they buy the cheapest ones possible to then transfer liability to the guest. We talked about vehicle guns, right? Guns and cars. What's the risk? right? The risk is probably the smash and grab, or maybe like the trunk gets popped by a valet, you know, driver or long-term parking sort of person. Uh, what do I recommend for guns and cars? This is one place where those little storage boxes can work. Those cheapo sort of pistol lock boxes. If you've got a carry piece, but you're going into an establishment where it's not permitted, sure. Someone who throws a brick through the car window, they are looking to steal a purse, a laptop, something like that. If this is cable locked under the seat, I mean, they're, they might try to rip it out of there, but it's probably gonna be your best bet. Again, watch those locks. A lot of them have that tubular. This is, a, this is something I did for that talk at DEF CON years ago. I took the tubular lock out of one of these products that I bought and I put an alloy lock in its place. So I, I modified the tailpiece a little bit to make it fit. So now this little micro vault, which is, eh, sure, it's fine. It's, it's thick sheet metal, but it's still sheet metal but at least it's not got a tubular lock on the damn thing. And I showed people in the talk how I could do it. It wasn't hard. It's just some screws and you put it in the right place and away you go. So there we are. Much, much better 
than a lot of those other boxes out there. I'm generally very skeptical of those units that use biometrics. Uh, I'm not some sort of Luddite, but if you understand how biometrics work, it is possible to mess with them, to fake them out. I did a whole thing during that DEF CON talk about making fake fingers out of rubber. So here's a little finger cast and I'm pouring you know, rubber into these molds and I'm just making fake fingers with which to unlock these safes. So here's a gun safe, it's very James Bond. It's like you have this fake finger in your pocket and you peel it off and you stick it on your other hand and then away you go. Is it likely that you know a valet is going to be in collusion with your server at dinner and get your fingerprints off your glass of wine and make a fake finger and run down? I mean, no, it's not very likely. Uh, that, the reason I don't like fingerprint safes is biometrics. They, you know, electronic stuff fails on you when you need it the most. What if you really, really need your grenade or your wee zapper in the moment? So keep that in mind. Uh, I, I do. I celebrate everyone who does fun hacking of stuff. Uh, this was somebody who converted their safe to be electronic when it wasn't. This was an all mechanical safe and a buddy of mine. So Jake, my buddy, Eerie Quiet, uh, he added an electronic lock. And to go one better, in addition to building this electronic lock and putting it in uh, on the front, it was RFID based. It was an electronic RFID system. So he made a little custom antenna and 3D printed it. And he, much like me, is a person who has implantable credentials. So now his hand can unlock his gun safe. And I think that's pretty cool. Again, I might not like electronic locks all the time, but I like that video. I, cel I celebrate his process, which brings us back to just in your home, right? What, what do we come down to? We gotta say, what's the risk? What are the risks? How do we address it? Fire, we've talked about fire ratings. Get a fire rated safe, get insurance. A lot of times basic homeowners insurance will not cover guns. Uh, my wife and I, our USAA policy has a separate rider. It's, it's called a valuable personal property policy. And we have, we literally had to index every gun in the house, which God, that took forever. It was just constantly opening stuff like, oh fuck, another set of firearms, pull them out, put them all in one dot, God, bloody list. But yes, you could get an insurance related, you know, insurance rated safe, a proper burglar, you know, rated safe. Uh, and, you know, getting the insurance, getting fire insurance, getting homeowners insurance that covers it, getting flood insurance. Flood is, as you have maybe seen from the commercials, right? Flood is a bigger risk in many parts of this country than fire. So be aware of what you're likely to, you know, is that one of the risks you may face? Location in the home of where your guns are may actually play a role when you think about the risk of flood. And of course, the urgency of need. All of this gets balanced against rapid access. Uh, higher security is often less rapid to access. So that's why in our home, uh, the expensive stuff, the cool stuff that's in the basement in the heavy duty safes and the defensive guns are in easier to access. I really love all mechanical push button style, simplex styles, the style, that sort of five button lock. I like those products. Uh, Fort Knox makes a pretty decent one. A number of people make a pretty decent one for pistols and long guns. If you're worried about that theft, again, it comes back to who's, who's the potential thief, right? Best mitigations, find good locking storage, and then add monitoring, right? If it's the loco bozo burglar, you know, a wide range of products might be suitable. But curious youths, man, don't dismiss the fact that, again, we all want our, we want to raise our kids right, and but there's a lot of information out there on YouTube about bypassing a lot of these locks. I, maybe that first cabinet right there, I don't know if I'd go with that, right? Like, I don't think so. Honestly, even that little Fort Knox box has a tubular key on there. Teenager, teenager's gonna know how to pick that. Teenager could have a little bit of spare money. They've been saving up their allowance. They order a tubular pick for 50, 60 bucks. I don't know, man. You might even have kids who can compromise your electronic monitoring. During this pandemic, I told this story last time too, kids were figuring out how to glitch out their Wi-Fi and drop out of class and be like, oh, the wi fis not working, I'm sorry, teacher. Most of these cameras are Wi-Fi based, they're not wired. Ubiquity is one of the few that uses PoE, power over ethernet wired devices, right? If a criminal jams the Wi-Fi, there are turnkey products, handheld products that exist right now. And we are seeing reports on the news of criminals jamming, you know, ring doorbells and jamming nest cameras and doing something in a house. So if you've got curious teens, maybe 
I mean, I could see myself being this this team. They cut the hard line. Yeah, it's very Matrix. Uh, Eli says, I could see myself like if I want to mess with the safe, but there's a camera in that room. Well, maybe I'll just jam the Wi-Fi and I'll go mess with the safe for a little bit. And I got a half an hour of time and then I go back and then the Wi-Fi comes back up. And if I'm home alone the next day, kids, you know, kids who are home alone for long stretches of after school time. I don't know, man. I would say maybe someone learns how to actually manipulate the safe dial and they're just working on that. Like they've watched me talk about this. So what is the ultimate mitigation? If you've got an especially determined person who might get in, I mean, we all know this too, right? The, the mitigation for a lot of things is talk to your kids, talk to them about firearms, teach them about firearms, introduce them to firearms uh, and gun safety, ultimately demystifying firearms. And it's all part of a holistic approach, making them the responsible kids that we wanna see them grow up to be as gun owners like ourselves. If you want a little extra insurance, somebody mentioned it earlier, you can stick a trail cam inside your safe, right? They don't know it's there, you know it's there. They open that door, well, you're gonna have a conversation later because it's gonna alert you that something happened immediately. And if it turns out you need to have that conversation, well, it's better to find out from the trail cam than to find out from a, you know, a horrible accident or a school administrator or something like that. Remember, you trust open. your kids to a point. Dude, uh, this is someone's kid in real life in a sporting goods Dude. store, not in their house, but they screwed around and they got in a safe and then another kid locked it and then panicked and they're trying to unlock it. But the safe, you notice the safe is now oh, in penalty shit. mode. Dude, it's so locked. they've tried it's the locked. wrong combination faster and faster and more oh and God, more dude. and more. You get, and now there, it's jammed out. Hard. So that's the NL yeah, rotable. That's the, the Italian dude, lock. Call someone, so then they had to go get store officials something. and the store officials tried the combination you know, the and they couldn't open it because it was in penalty mode. And then they had to get the police and the fire department involved. It is like Snapchatting inside the safe <laughs> so we love our kids and we trust our kids but they are still kids their brains are still developing so help them develop and grow and give them the best shot of growing up healthy and happy so thank you so much for listening this was this was kind of fun it's the only the second time ever that i've delivered this talk and i love i love uh you know hearing your thoughts i it's a lot of material i know it is it's more than an hour it's more than you were in for maybe but all the slides, they're going to be online. Obviously, the talk is recorded. But with the time we've got remaining, um, yeah, I'm glad you like the retro cult there. I like it, too. I'm going to be taking it to Montana this weekend to show some friends and got an outing there. But talk to me. Uh, what do we got? This was great, says Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. I don't know if I can. If I'm an administrator. I can let everyone on mute or something like that. I can stop. Uh, my- yeah, we'll, we'll, we, we, can, we can take care of that. Uh, that was, uh, once again, awesome. I actually think it was a little better than the last time. I think it was a little cool. crisper, so, you know uh well well done uh we can we can be it can be free for all we can do free for all let's do it yeah i got a little bit Uh, eric's gotta do it though eric you're you're in charge boss you can make it so everyone can unmute feel free oh no i can't i did it all right if you want to unmute yourself folks I think I did that right. Yep, that yeah. works. There we go. Dave says Bring the questions. Oh, yeah. I posted in the chat, will you have a list of the things that you recommended? Yeah, so the I can put a list just by itself as a text list, but that those last few slides is where I tried to say, here's like your most practical list of brands or list of products that I like. So that those camera brands, those couple of safe brands that I think are pretty safe bet. Uh, yeah, I can I can distill that down into something more text based though. That would be awesome. Thank you. Sorry, my camera's not on. My computer doesn't have a video. No worries. <laughs> Everybody else, now's your time. Have to take off. Thank you. Informative says Romulus. Well, you're very welcome. I think a lot of us have to take off. It is this was the last thing of the of the day. I appreciate the time slot. And I appreciate just getting to getting to be here. And again, I'm uh, I'm I am findable on, on that internet, right? I can, I'll, I'll share it back up here. So, I am I am these things. I, I I have an email address that's always very overwhelmed, but I try to respond. I am at Olaf on all of the stuff on the internet, and I put one ice cube in my bourbon. 
at the bar if you see me there. <laughs> Excellent way to end. We'll, we'll send you. We'll, we'll we'll send you a glass. Outstanding. Excellent. Well, I really do hope that we can all raise a glass together in person uh, in the future. I know that this year. A lot of us were looking forward to Ohio. I'm really proud of everyone who worked so hard. Thank you to everyone who organized this. Uh, organizing virtual is just as, if not harder, than organizing in-person conferences. So thanks for pulling it off. Maybe next year we'll all get to be together. Yeah, we managed to do it in, a, what, about a month. I think we canceled it about a month ago and then had to switch gears. So uh, the Ohio guys did a really great job of trying to put on a show. And then everybody, obviously... We just decided it couldn't happen, but Thanks. this has been wonderful uh, and informative and excellent. And thank you so much for being here. Thank yeah, you. Dave, let me just say uh, thanks for being patient with us on this one. And oh, yeah. thank you so much for doing this, man. Really appreciate it. Oh man, it. not my first rodeo. This worked just fine. <laughs> awesome. All right, well uh, guys pay attention to the schedule. We'll figure out what the next thing is and we'll see you then. Excellent. See y'all later. Thanks, everybody. Bye now.